Hi. Today I'd like to do a little demonstration on EFI definitions and sensors. Before we get started tuning these devices, we have to come to a common knowledge of the terms. The first one I want to talk about is ECU, ECM, or standalone engine controller. On the screen are two of the more popular units on the market. On the left is an AMP EFI MS3 Pro Ultimate. On the right is a MoTeC M400. The AMP EFI is relatively new, been out about five months now. Uh, the MoTeC has been out several years. Both of these devices are in the range of about six inches by an inch and a half by maybe four inches. Commonly, they have maybe 30 or 40, 50 pins, depending on the unit. Uh, the pins are for input and output. Input are things like temperature sensors, that sort of thing, throttle position sensors. On the output side is injector drivers and possibly boost controllers. The first thing I want to describe is barometric pressure. The entire world has about 14.7 PSI pressure at sea level. So let's go through the definition of how they come up with that number. If you take a one inch square at the surface of the earth and run that column all the way up 600 miles into the air, at 600 miles there is virtually no air molecules, no atmosphere whatsoever. If you could add up the weight of all those molecules all the way up and down through this one inch column 600 miles long, the weight of that air would be 14.7 pounds. So that entire weight of 14.7 pounds is being pulled to the earth to one square inch at the bottom of your column. That also translates into 100 kPa or as the Guys in the drag race world and the boosted world of turbochargers like to refer to it as zero pounds of boost. So now let's talk about the term MAP or manifold absolute pressure, sometimes referred to as manifold air pressure. The barometric pressure we talked about is all around the box. The box is sealed up. There's an inlet and an outlet down at the bottom right the yellow and the, the black arrow. The yellow arrow is air into the box with a controlled air leak, a valve, and on this side typically is a vacuum pump. In our case, it's the pistons pulling air out of the intake manifold, which is the same as this sealed air box. MAP goes from 100 kPa if both valves are open, if we start pulling a vacuum on the black line, what would happen is the manifold air pressure would start dropping from 100, 90, 80, 70, and you may be able to get it down to 15 or 20 kPa in the inside of the chamber. That pressure in an intake manifold on a normally aspirated motor runs from about 100 kPa or 99 kPa at full throttle down to about 15 or 20 kPa or think of it as percent air, 20% air in a downshift, in a big downshift. So now let's talk about pulse width and duty cycle. These two terms are very much related. On the bottom we have time, and on any one of these is a single signal. The first one is 20% duty cycle. Picture we have zero volts here, we run up to 12 volts, drop back down to zero, and wait some time and apply another 12 volts for a certain amount of time. That certain amount of time is here, the pulse width. Basically, the pulse width at idle on one of these motors is typically about 
two milliseconds, and then for about 16 or 20, 25 milliseconds, we don't apply voltage to the injector. The injector only sprays as we have voltage applied. So the first one is 20% duty cycle. The second one is a demonstration of 40% duty cycle or applying voltage 40% of the time. The third one down is an 80% duty cycle or 80% of the time voltage is applied to whatever device we are trying to control. And 100% duty cycle implies we have power going to the device all of the time. It never turns off. Looking at this, it's fairly obvious you can never get past 100% duty cycle. So now, let's look at the basic four-stroke engine. We have drawn here an air filter, a throttle body, we'll get into that later, that controls the airflow through the motor. It goes along the green line into the combustion chamber. Piston runs up and down, pulling air in and out of the chamber. You have your cams, valves, and exhaust system with a muffler at the end. We'll go through each of these pieces. but. Volumetric efficiency is, let's assume that this is a one liter single cylinder motor. Every time the piston comes down, we pull in one liter of air as shown by the brown box. If the piston comes up with the exhaust valve open, the majority of that brown burned gas will go down the exhaust system. The catch is, it's never 100%, or almost never 100% of that exhaust gets out of the combustion chamber. So the next time the piston comes down and tries to pull in one liter of air, <clears throat> there is some unburnable fuel or air, unburnable air, because there's no oxygen left in it. So what we're really doing is pulling in almost a liter of air and polluting it some with the previous compression stroke. That air left behind in the previous exhaust stroke is the primary thing that drives volumetric efficiency. A volumetric efficiency of 100% implies every bit of this burned air gets out of the motor every time. In reality, at idle, we're about 45% volumetric efficiency, meaning quite a bit exhaust, <clears throat> quite a bit of the exhaust was left behind. <clears throat> MAF Airfloor, MAF. These go by a couple of different names. MAF or MAF Airfloor are the two most common names. These things were designed, to the best of my knowledge, or at least became popular uh, with Ford in about 1990. They became popular in the Tauruses. This happens to be an early Taurus one. The way this thing works is air comes down through this known size hole. It's maybe two inches. <clears throat> There's also a smaller hole that has a heated wire in it. And what they do is these things know the temperature of the air coming past the wire, and the wire changes resistance as it cools off. So they vary the voltage with the controller, knowing how much voltage or how much amperage they're putting through the wire and knowing the temperature of the air flowing through this small hole running parallel with the big one, they can calculate how much air must be going through the big hole. There are other versions of it. They all work very similar. Warm-up enrichment. If you remember the old days of <clears throat> carburetors and chokes and all that sort of thing, venturis, the way we used to increase the fuel was choke the motor. We had an air valve that went over the throttle and pulled a little more vacuum on the venturis, and that way we got a little more fuel to the motor. Well, in EFI, we really don't have those. So what we do is hey, we have a table that basically says, if we're up, in my case, 124 degrees or higher, we have a 100 multiplier or a multiplier of 1. As we get close to 0, uh, this happens to be in Fahrenheit, 
zero Fahrenheit, I add, I have a multiplier of 147 or about 50% more fuel. But that's how we handle warm up enrichment on fuel injected motors. This is the throttle body. You would have the cable from your foot feed right here. It twists the throttle. Actually, it would go horizontally. Twist the throttle open. Here is your throttle position sensor on the end of the shaft. All this thing does is feed zero to five volts back to your controller ECM based on how far open the throttle is. We also have this thing called the IAC or idle air controller. What this is, is a calibrated air leak with a plunger controlled by the ECU that moves in and out to control, accurately control your idle speed. These things are wonderful for motors on the street that happen to have air conditioners or varying load because you can tell the control module to add a little fuel, or I'm sorry, add a little airflow as the load on the crankshaft goes up slightly. This is the same throttle at a slightly different angle held at full throttle, also known as wide open throttle or WOT. So back in about 1970, 1980 were the early fuel injection. They were based on what was known as alpha N volumetric efficiency tables. Remember the volumetric efficiency? Well, this is a table it goes from zero throttle position up to 100% throttle position. Going the other way is RPM. Let me clear the screen. Is RPM going from, say, idle up through 9,000 RPM. This table runs up to about 100% volumetric efficiency at the torque peak. This happens to be a race motor. And the torque peak's around 7,000 RPM and fades off a little bit as you get up to 9,000 RPM. So you can see the 93, 94 volumetric efficiency up at full throttle, wide open throttle, and max RPM. Later, the manufacturers figured out that they could take a manifold air pressure, measure that, and better model this motor, more consistently model the motor. So on the load, you have manifold air pressure. Remember I said it runs from about 15 kPa on a big downshift through 100 kPa at full throttle. That's the ambient air pressure. In the case of a turbocharged or supercharged motors, these, mo these numbers go from about 15 up to 200 or 300 or 400 kPa. 15 pounds of boost would be 200 in that case. Um, but the table works very similar to the alpha N table. It's just using a different load axis on the left. There's also a turning method known as ITB, which is independent throttle body. This is similar to what motorcycles have, where in the bottom left corner, for the most part, or the bottom half, you're really watching the manifold air pressure on the top half, you're watching the throttle position, and in the middle, it's a blend that's handled within the, IC, within the uh, ECU. If we look at this table in a 3D graph, uh, where manifold air pressure increases, RPM increases on the bottom, and this would be the idle area, this would be the full throttle, high RPM area, and our torque peak will have a high point, roughly 100 volumetric efficiency. Notice this table is relatively smooth as you run through the power band. If you see spikes, valleys, anything of that nature going on, it's an indication that something else is a problem. We also have AFR. What this is, is the air fuel ratio. The air fuel ratio runs, or actually by definition, is the pounds of air coming into the motor divided by 
the pounds of fuel you're feeding the motor. Your goal is to run out of oxygen at exactly the same time you run out of fuel because that's when the burning stops. 14.7 is a magical mathematical number that for gasoline, pure gasoline out of the pump, we really don't get pure gasoline anymore, but pure gasoline runs 14.7 AFR is stoichiometric. You'll see that word uh, a lot. Basically, stoichiometric is, again, 14.7 AFR. As we get to a manifold air pressure of 100 or full throttle, you want to go to a ratio of about 13 to 1 on a naturally aspirated motor. On a supercharged motor at 200 kPa, if this table was taller or rescaled, you might be in the 12 AFR range. Remember, these numbers that I'm giving you are all gasoline. As you get into alcohol and other such things, the numbers do change. So now, here is your basic motor again with all of the sensors that go through that we use to measure and calculate the airflow. Let's go through one of these, each one at a time. On the left is the barrow. Remember, the same barrow that we were measuring before, there is a sensor that sits outside the air filter somewhere, often it's on the ECU, and basically it just measures the ambient air pressure. As you get to higher and higher pressure, or higher and higher altitudes, say Colorado is uh, 5,280 feet at Denver, that barrow may be as low as 82 kPa. At the top of the high peaks, you're in the 60 kPa range. That is a constant pressure sensor as you run up and down hills. The next one is the throttle position sensor in gold and the gold circle. And all that does is measures the angle of the throttle blades at all times. That is what controls the actual pressure in the intake compared to the barrel. The map, here it is right here, that's the manifold air pressure. That is measuring the pressure between the throttle position sensor and the intake valve. Now, that, that pressure varies as that intake valve opens and closes. And what we have to do, this happens to be a single cylinder motor, but if we've got four, six, eight cylinders, they commonly are all pulling off a single plenum and that number doesn't change much. In the case of independent throttle bodies or single cylinder engines, this number is an average and we will play in the software later to show you how to filter that. The next, temp the next sensor is the manifold air temperature. We call it the MAT. Uh, it goes by several different names depending on the, uh, the software. But what it's doing is constantly measuring the temperature of the air in the intake. Normally on a normally aspirated motor, that number runs fairly close to the temperature at the barrow sensor. If you get into turbocharged, supercharged motors without an intercooler to cool the airflow, those numbers can get up as much as 100, 150 degrees over ambient air temperature or the temperature that's in the engine compartment. The motor really only cares, at least as far as the ECU is concerned, of the manifold air temperature, the temperature of the air inside the intake. By the way, uh, hot air is less dense, cold air is more dense. That's why we keep track of that. Coolant temperature. Down here, it's in the water jackets. Basically, we use that for as the motor warms up, we also can pull fuel away from the motor or add fuel as it's cold. So we, that's how we tell if the motor is on a cold start or, for that matter, overheating. So now we have our crankshaft position sensor, our crank position sensor. Basically what this thing does is it keeps track of where the piston is 
in the stroke. At top dead center, bottom dead center, or somewhere in between. These things work by having little nubs or teeth on the crankshaft. This is spinning. I probably should have had that with an arrow on it. But as these little teeth come in and out of the crankshaft position sensor, it sends a signal to the ECU. The most common, this was drawn for simplicity with four teeth. Uh, Miata's actually use four teeth. But if the most common is 36 teeth with one missing. We also have the camshaft position sensor, a cam position sensor. Remember that the crankshaft spins 720 degrees per engine cycle, where the cam position sensor only goes through 360 degrees. That is the sensor we use to know where in the 700 degree, 720 degrees of crankshaft rotation the motor is in. By the way, it's a combination of those two sensors that give the ECU everything it needs to know. The next one is the oxygen sensor. It sits downstream in the exhaust system, and basically what it's doing is measuring oxygen in the exhaust system, and if it finds oxygen, it's, it assumes you're lean, you ran out of fuel before you ran out of oxygen. Rich, on the rich side, an oxygen sensor is really measuring the unburned hydrocarbons or the fuel that never got burned, so you must have run out of oxygen. This sensor essentially verifies all the calculations you made with the first sensors to see if you got the correct answer at the exhaust system. The mass air floor, the MAF, shown here in gold, it sits between the air filter and the throttles and constantly measures the actual air going past it. In the high performance world, they get a bit of a bad rap it's mostly because the manufacturer sized them a little small for emissions. But when you get into the high performance world, you hate to have restrictions in the intake, so people tend to avoid them. I like them, but you have to size them fairly large. The next sensor right here is a NOx sensor. Literally what the thing is, is a microphone listening for the noise that knock makes or pre-ignition. These things are fairly dependent on the motor and the block, what it's made of, the frequencies that come from knock on this particular motor. So it's best to get one from the manufacturer that built the engine. Um, NOC is this uncontrolled burning of fuel, which we'll get into later. Uh, it's the thing that sounds like popcorn popping that you can hear from the passenger compartment. These I wasn't real sure how to, how to draw. So what I did is just to find them. Open loop fueling. That's when no corrections are made by the ECU based on what it has learned or observed from the O2 sensor. Closed loop fueling is when corrections to the fuel are made based on the readings from the O2 sensor, i.e. In the, in the volumetric efficiency table, if we always seem to be lean at one spot in the table, what we do is adjust the fuel the next time around with the long-term fuel trims. So now we have everything we need for the basic sensors. This is the gauge package I often use. It gives engine speed, manifold air pressure. In my case, I'm running ITB mode, so I use fuel load as a gauge. Normally on a, a speed density system, both of these numbers would be the same. Your throttle position, manifold air temp, and coolant temp. On the bottom is ignition events, ignition events, which we haven't really talked about, but we will. Pulse width and duty cycle. The EGO correction, or the correction that is being made because of what the ECU saw coming down the exhaust system. 
If it's lean, it will add fuel. If it's rich, it will pull fuel away. The air fuel ratio and the loss sink counter. What the loss sink counter is, is if in any time in the 720 degrees of rotation, the ECU has lost sync with the cam sensor and gets confused, it stops sending sparks, stops sending fuel, and registers a lost sync count. On a motor that everything's working well, that should always stay at zero or at least any time the motor is running. You might get one or two lost sync errors as you first start cranking, but you cannot have them while the motor's running. So now the last thing I want to talk about is pressure as it moves through the motor. Your barometric pressure, which keeps coming up, should be about 100 kPa. There's a slight pressure drop as the air goes into the air filter. Call it 99 kPa, for example. As the air goes through the throttle body, it might drop to 60 kPa, or 60% air. Fires, huge pressures in the uh, on the compression, it's in the neighborhood of 200 PSI, or uh, I guess it'd be what, but uh, 400 kPa, 600 kPa, I didn't really run the calc. Then the exhaust runs at, say, 105 kPa, slightly more than the outside air temperature. As it goes through the baffles in the muffler, it will eventually drop to 100 kPa at the end. I want to give thanks to all my friends at uh, TunerStudio.com, the developers of Megalog Viewer, which is the graphing software we will be looking at all of this data later, and Tuner Studio, which is where all these screenshots came from for the most part, DIY AutoTune, the suppliers for ECUs and all the parts and pieces, wiring connectors and that sort of thing we use for tuning motors, and MS Extra which is the support forum that I'm most often at. Thank you.